Hello, listeners. Welcome to Music Is My Life, a podcast from Berkeley Online. My name is Pat Healy, and I would like you to take note of our guest for this edition. If you could please state your name, sir. My name is Michael Melchiondo, and it's really, it's, it's a great last name because I know when it's a solicitor on the phone immediately, and they start struggling, I just hang right up. Now, if that name does not ring a bell, it's because he's known professionally by his stage name of Dean Ween, one half of the band Ween, obviously, who for nearly 30 years, along with Gene Ween, whose real name is Aaron Freeman, have been releasing into the world a very unique style of music. Is it silly? Sometimes. Is it serious? Sometimes. Is it strange? Sometimes. Is it awesome? Most times. And some of this was on a major label. Diener, as he is also known, is currently touring with the Dean Ween Group, which features all of the touring members of Ween, minus Diener. And the Dean Ween Group have an album called Rock 2, coming out on March 16th. The full lineup of Ween has also recently announced their first show of the summer at Red Rocks in Colorado on June 5th. Melchiondo and Freeman met in 1984, adopting the Ween surname in their early teenage years. But Melchiondo's love of music began a few years earlier than that, thanks to his father. First things I really remember were my dad's records. Now, my, my dad didn't have a, a big record collection, but the records that he had are so cool looking back. Uh, it, it was, uh, he, he went into the Navy in like 1960. And then when he came out, I guess after whatever it was, two years or four years, or, uh, you know, he, he met my mom, got married, all that. But, but uh, he just totally ignored the British movement like of music like he was so into soul music and doo-wop and and then old country and then funk (laughs) so you know there was there's very you know his record collection uh very tasty actually um but there was no you know there was no zap or 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 the kinks or the or the Beatles. He did have Sgt. Pepper. That was a big one. So anyway, that that's like kind of my first. That's kind of my first taste of uh, first things I remember. He would sing a lot of like old old Hank Williams, the real Hank Williams to us, and uh, Bob Wills and Texas Playboys and and uh, George Jones and Merrill Haggard and Willie and uh, you know that that kind of thing. And then he had records by Parliament, but he had he had just had this really diverse record collection that, you know, it was like kind of like he, you know, he he grew up a a, a Philly, you know, Jersey doo wop, nut, you know, um, and then like by the time he was raising kids, he resumed with, uh, you know, Cool and the Gang and Parliament and stuff like that. So. Uh, Really weird. So that's my first memory. And that rock and roll, there was a family down the street um, that had like five kids, this Irish family, and they all took turns babysitting me. And they had a they had record collections. They were teenagers, and they turned me on to. I remember hearing Ziggy Stardust. I remember hearing uh, Leonard Skinner, One More From the Road, the live record. I remember hearing uh, Southside Johnny and the Asbury Jukes. You know, and 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 the Beatles. The Beatles was the first thing that really turned me out. Like the Beatles, it still you know always has been my favorite band. Always will be my favorite band. But that that shit just like turned me out. I got the, you know, I had a wiped out copy of Sgt. Pepper's, and then I got those two greatest hits records, the double record, the red one. Yeah, the the red and the blue. Yeah, the red one, sixty two to sixty six, and then the sixty seven to seventy two or seventy or. Uh, you know, and that, and it, and it had the lyrics, if you remember, on the original sleeves, and that stuff, man, that was just like an endless. You know, I, I, I think when you're a kid, like uh, mystery is like a really big 
thing in rock and roll. It should be mysterious and dangerous. And and uh, the Beatles, man, those lyrics, you know, the lyrics to like "I Am the Walrus," and of course their voices on the older stuff, and just that that like that was really what kind of like turned me out. And then uh, I'm gonna I'm just gonna keep rambling. If you don't mind, yeah, go for it. I mean, go for like it. Really, it's, it's to answer this question properly, I have to. But but um. And then, and then it's a shame it doesn't really happen anymore, as far as I I can tell. But the radio, the radio was huge. You know, I mean, growing up in the seventies and the eighties, you know, the the uh, radio was everything. You know, that's that's where, you know, I would I listened to the Doctor Demento show religiously. That was, so did Aaron when he was a kid. That was a big part of the weird things and later on and. And uh, you know the King Biscuit Flower Hour doing whole concerts. I guess those are my roots. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, and 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 later on, I went on to find my like real influences after that. But that's the original stuff. After that, you know, I just became all about the funk and all about the guitar for you know for a long time. Bob Dylan, you know, all very very classic standard normal tastes. Zeppelin. Hendrix, Carlos, P Funk, The Beatles, the Stones. Yeah, and I, I don't think your influences ever change really. I, I think that, that 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 shit is over when you're like sixteen or seventeen. You know, you're always gonna go back to those records. You know? Yeah. And, and was was it a bonding thing with you and your dad, or or was it just kind of you raiding his collection? It it uh it was a bonding thing, but not nearly compared to what it is now, you know, because um, mm -hmm. I know his, I know what he's going to like, you know, and he knows what I'm going to like. And surprisingly enough, you know, my seven mid seventies father could send me a YouTube video of something that I've never heard. That's so funky. <laughs> you know, It's like it's pretty amazing actually, because he's not a musicologist by any means, you know, he's not, you know, I don't, I don't, I doubt he has an iTunes account or, you know what I mean? Right. Did did anybody else in your family play? No. Uh that's the other really strange thing is um I have I have two halves of my family. My mother is Canadian. So I really didn't grow up I I'm mean, obviously I never lived in Canada and I never really was nearly as close with that half of my life as I was with my Trenton Italian family, you know. And everybody in the, Named Melchiondo has great, great taste in music and um, has an incredible sense of rhythm and uh, appreciates and buys and goes to see live music. But uh, no, I'm the only player, as far as I know. And when did that start? That started in around 84 when I met Aaron. Um, oh, so I, you, you hadn't been playing on your own at all? You, you I, just. I, I had. The, the way that started was. Uh, I uh my my father is a used car dealer. He's retired now, but he had a car lot down in, in in Trenton, and there was a music store across the street. And I was really flipping out on everything at once. I was just taking in, you know, everything. So I I got him to buy me like a crappy pawn shop, you know, like twenty five dollar guitar, and uh, I just tuned the strings so they would make a chord. I didn't know how to actually play it. I got a drum set first, and then I got the guitar. So I was making these, like, I'd take a tape recorder down the basement, play a drum beat, and then take it upstairs. And while I was overdubbing it to another cassette, I'd play a guitar over it. And then and then in... So like, just like boombox to boombox? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess yeah. It's pre yeah, pretty track. much. No, no, no. It was, no, the four track didn't come into play until surprisingly, like, five years later. Even though they were yeah. available then, I just didn't know it. Um, right. I, I, so I, how I went, old were you at this point? I was 14. Um, okay. Maybe 13, but I met Aaron when I was 14. Um, and it turns out he was doing exactly the same thing with uh, more like Casios and, and uh, you know, the built-in beats from the Casios. And, you know, it was like a little weirder. I hate to just make Ween sound so simple, but I mean, at, at first I was like the punk rock nut. You know, I was just getting into the, I was looking for the most abrasive, hardest music that was out there, no matter what it was. And he was into the weirdest stuff out there, no matter what it was, you know. Yeah. And there was stuff where we met on common ground. We both loved Devo very much. You know, we both loved uh, 
the Laurie Anderson or Superman. You know, we both love the Dr. Demento show. His father was a hippie. His father was at Woodstock, okay? My father was probably the guy that would fucking throw rocks at hippies. You know, so there was, there was, uh, you know, Aaron had, Aaron's dad didn't have a lot of records either, but between the cool ones that I had and the cool ones he had, it was, that's kind of what Ween is, you know? He had, he had, you know, everything from Nina Simone to the first two Velvet Underground records, to the Richie Haven's Alarm Clock, you know, to, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, everything, Beefheart, you know, and so... You know those those influences together. You know that's kind of like what we and then we turned each other on to music as it was coming out. And were you guys teaching yourselves like going straight up punk rock ethics, or were you taking lessons as well? No, no, no. It was totally, totally taught ourselves everything. Uh, we uh, that didn't come till a little bit later, or or a, a bit away a, a way bit later, actually. Um, you know, for a while it was just drums and that guitar tuned to an open chord. It didn't matter how many strings were even on it. Uh, you know, I just tuned it to whatever chord, and that was the chord. I would play it with my thumb across all the frets, so it would move, you know, around. And then I, I think it took us a year or more to get a bass, um, a pawn shop kind of bass. And then, it, and then, like one day, we wrote that song. You fucked up. It's the first song on our first uh, record. And it actually yeah. had a, a verse and a chorus. And it was like, that was like our first, I think that's one of our first, if not our first song, song. Uh -huh. And then I was, by that time, I was just, I thought I was the only one in the world, of course, like a, only a teenager would to know about Jimi Hendrix, you know. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, this is a secret only I know about, you know. And then from there, Zep, and then I then I wanted to play guitar, like really, really yeah. bad. And I had a friend uh, that was willing to teach me. So I learned a little bit, and I showed Aaron what I was learning, and we were figuring it out on our own. And um, you know, well, it's so interesting too because you, that first album, it feels like your sound is like already developed. Yeah, our that stuff. Uh, it's it's really really strange because that. I mean, talking about this sounds really pretentious, but that record, our first few records are really kind of, no one has ever really gotten it right. Mm -hmm. the, the, the first record was a studio record. I mean, when, and, and, and there's a huge, huge thing that happened that no, no one, I don't know why no one has ever mentioned it, but everything that we did was with real drums. And, you know, everything from 84 to 90 had real drums on it because we were living at my parents' house and we were in high school. You know, uh, we graduated in 88, you know, but they sold the house in like 89 and 90. We got our own place. So so we did that first record to 16-track tape in Andrew Weiss's living room. Yeah. And we got to redo all of like, it was, the first record was kind of like a greatest hits of the first six years of Ween. And it's kind of, it's, it's a rock and roll record. It sounds like a band, you know, it's, it's, really distorted and you know it's full on drum kit on almost every single song and then we moved and then the next two records is when we got the four track and we were living in this tiny apartment and we had to get a drum machine because we couldn't even fit a kit in there and the neighbors would have gone insane so our chat our sound just completely changed from the second and third record you know it went we went to being a four track people started calling us lo-fi and you know and experimental and all that but it was just it was just out of necessity you know like right but it, it it never comes up people think you know they i don't know if they've never heard the first record or but they just think it was done on a four track right. you know? well i was actually particularly talking about like your guitar sound it, it, it feels like that was developed by the debut you know that 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 lead on uh yeah the lead on lm well, however, you know what song I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, LMLRP. <laughs> uh, like that lead is the Ween Dean Ween sound. Thank you. I mean, do, I, I'm assuming this is this is for Berkeley, right? School of Music. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, so I'm assuming you're a musician. Yes. Are you a guitarist? I play guitar. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, I mean, have you ever wondered if you're getting worse? Like, <laughs> I, like I, I'm I'm serious, and I don't mean that in a way because I know I'm getting better. I, I'm positive of it, 
But I've only wondered I, like when I stagnate, you know, when I well, have yeah, yeah. It. But I, I hear some of that stuff. I don't really, you know, go back and I'm not very reflective. I, I still want to make new music, but I go back and I listen to some of the stuff that we did, like if it's a live thing from '89, '88. 87, 90, you know, and it's really fucking rad. You know, the, the uh, guitar playing is really rad. And it was almost like I I almost have to dumb my thing down to get back to that spot. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, then you listen to Neil. You know, Neil has never played better guitar than he has in the third chapter of his life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or whatever chapter he's in. He's playing the best guitar of his life. Prince was easily playing the best guitar of his life year after year. You know what I mean? It only got better. Right. And I'm not really a fan, but I'll say it. Clapton's playing, but, you know, I'm not a Clapton fan. I never really was, but, you know, and Carlos, even though he's making these pop singles and all, Carlos rules. Carlos is shredding, you know? You know, I, I... no, I've got more skill and more knowledge and more, more game now. But uh, but it was like you figured you, at that point you had already figured out like okay, I like a phaser, I like distortion, I like wah. phaser, a wah wah, and an echo. That's still what I use. That's, that's yeah. It. yeah, that's yeah. that's that's pretty much it. I, I, but you know, um, but then I want then there's other people like you listen to like Richie Blackmore. I I, I see him. You know, even from like the mid to late seventies, and he can't play the solo from Highway Star. You know, mm-hmm. like he just can't play that fast or that whatever. And it's like, you know, but you got to keep yourself scared. <laughs> you got to keep challenging right. yourself. Like, ugh, ugh, you know. But I'm, I, I'll deconstruct if I need to. You know. <laughs> and, and was it always the strat for you from the very get go as after that yeah, pawn shop guitar? Yes, it, it absolutely was and is. Uh, I have I have I have like forty or fifty guitars, but uh, I mean my my thing is so simple. It's really funny. Like I wanted to play like Jimi Hendrix. That was to me to this day. I mean, from the first day and to this day, that's the greatest guitar player in the world. There's no argument that can be made. For anybody else, in a close second, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to know what he had, you know. So it was like, okay, a Strat, a wah wah, and a loud amp. You know that that's all I needed to know. And as it turns out, uh, my friend Billy Tucker, who taught me to play guitar, played exactly that. <laughs> so, you know, I never changed. I just like started there, and uh, you know, Tucker played it too. And these were the gauge strings he bought, and this was the the gauge picks he used, and this was the kind of guitar. And I just have never really, you know, I've tried other stuff, but that's my thing now at this point, you know. Right, right. There's no, there's no, there's no backing away from it, you know. Right. It would almost be weird if you switched now. I mean, I do, I do, I I've got a really nice alembic guitar now, like a really beautiful one they made for me. Probably the nicest guitar I've ever played in the whole world. Mm-hmm. But I can borrow anybody's Strat from any year in any condition made in any country. It could be Japanese, Mexican, vintage, custom shop. And I can go to an amp and turn, without even it being on, turn the dials, and kick that thing on and know exactly what's going to come out of it. You know what I mean? That's my shit, the Strat, yeah. So let's back up a tiny bit. You know, with those first three albums... At what point did you know it was a career and you knew that this was never going to do? Never. I'm still, I'm still waiting for people to figure out that we don't know what the hell we're doing at all, to be honest with you. But well, uh, I remember I first saw you guys on the, I think it was the Chocolate and Cheese tour in like Providence. And it was a small room. And I, I think that was your first tour with the band, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was the second, that might have been the second show. We played Maxwell's the night before. It was the very first. Yeah. And then that was the second one. It was great, but it was just interesting because, you know, there were some songs that the band would sit out because they had. Yeah. We, we all, and... That was the last time we did that, too. Really? So when we when we went through this thing where Ween was so closely identified as the two of us and the tape deck, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, going to see us live was not going to see like a rock concert like in any other i don't think you could compare us to anything because 
it was just the two of us in a cassette deck of me playing the real drums on it. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, in the back. So when we went and made that record, it was very slick sounding for us, first of all. And we were very insecure that, you know, about it. It was like, oh, not in a sellout way, but just sort of like a, 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 a change, a, a, a dramatic change, you know, from the, you know, the, the sort of vibe that we'd established with the second and third one. So to go out with a live band, it was like, I mean, I I think I still have close friends that believe that like that was it for Ween when we went to a real band. Really, <laughs> it was like thirty years ago now. But that's but, funny. Um, I remember so, I remember from that show. It was interesting. There was this guy there who was just yelling like "Chocolate and Cheese is a great fucking album," and that was what he yelled between songs. And it was not that well attended, which is surprising. It was interesting because it felt like that was almost the affirmation like he he almost perceived the insecurities of the band or something and he was just yelling that I was yeah that, that was, was that was see now that was like that's a really funny show i'm 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 i don't think i've i'm positive i've never met anybody that was there i remember that i wanted to kill myself after that show really i, I, I loved so, it i thought it sucked so bad but we were going through an identity crisis and like I said, I, I I have an elephant's memory, but I remember playing Voodoo Lady that night with the backing tracks behind us and like something else. Played a couple songs like that. And it was just totally like a sign of weakness. It was like we weren't committed completely. And and within like two or three weeks of that, we were playing three hour concerts. And like like the ween of today, you know what I mean? Yeah, we just totally ditched it, abandoned it, never had that insecurity again. It was just those first few shows, and it was like screw that, you know. All these songs that had always been exactly a minute and thirty seconds, like played. I got a weasel the same way for like seven years up to that point. Yeah, could now become thirty minute songs, you know. And we were having such a ball figuring out how to do it, you know. Um, and then it just got like from there, you know, it just got way, way, way over the top. You know, like like I said, three, four hour concerts. So you saw you saw something that was like a, th a three hour like transition phase. <laughs> right. Right. And it's interesting too, like coming from such a punk rock background, and I had a punk rock background as well, and and Watching that show, it was really exciting to see the possibilities of what two people can do and what a band can do. And then it was interesting to, I think it was the Mollusk tour was after that or maybe later on Chopped and Cheese seeing mm -hmm. you guys and watching like Jam Kids were coming out. I kind of forget that it was something so weird at first for us when that happened because now it's so ordinary. But, um, you know, it's like the last thing in the world you would expect would be the wean play on a bill with Mo and fish and, you know, you know, shit, shit like that. But we had the stuff in, con we actually jam. And I mean, I'm not going to name names, but I'm just going to diss every single band on that scene uh, at once. I mean, the jam jamming is jamming is deep purple made in Japan. You know, I mean, right. that's jamming. They're rocking out, you know, yes, lot, you know, they're jam, you know, crimson, you know, uh, it's it rocks, but it jams, but it's in the context of a song. It's not just all the jam, and plus it, it has no teeth. That it doesn't. A, a lot of that stuff doesn't rock at all. Well, I haven't found anything that really rocks. You know, I mean, the Almond Brothers are a jam band. You know, the Grateful Dead jam. You know, Deep Purple jammed. Right. Carlos jammed. Yeah. James Brown jammed. You know, shit. But but uh. You know, if you can't just start off with a jam, you know, I mean, if it's you're going to do a 20 minute song and it's pre planned, well, that's bullshit right there, you know? Like, I, I'm always waiting for that moment where the distortion kicks in, you know? Like, yeah. You know, like 10 minutes into the solo, all of a sudden the flanger and the distortion, and, the, and then you get the echoplex and you're freaking out on acid and like your fists are in the air, you know? It, it just doesn't happen. Like, it doesn't happen, you know? I think that's where we come in. <laughs> right, right. So throughout that period when, when you're going in Chocolate and Cheese and, and you, you're on Electra, you know, the previous album was on Electra and that's that's big at the time. And are you at that point realizing this is a career or are you still just... Um, The only time that I ever realized that I had a career, honestly, was 
and and this is totally true. I I, I pumped gas um, six days a week, and Aaron worked at a taco place, um, and we never got paid for anything, and and I never expected to, and I I don't like when bands play my local bar and they expect to get a couple hundo or something. You know, it's like, man, you know, you're gonna get it. forget it. You know, <laughs> like don't don't assume you're coming in. The, you know, if you get some couple bucks, that's great. Right. You know, at that point in in your life, but but um, we made uh we had made Godween Satan and we made we made the pod and we got a publishing deal, Warner Chapel, uh, for a whopping three thousand dollar advance, um, which we had to split and pay the IRS, which of course we didn't set any money aside for them. So I had 1500 and I was like, man, I'm a working musician. Uh, I mean, I was like, uh, that's the best check I ever got in my life. Actually was that first check, that publishing check, you know, and we had just signed away about like 150 songs <laughs> for like 20 years, <laughs> you know, for, for three grand. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you know, uh, we got it all back eventually, you know, the, all that shit expired. But I mean, that's, I think that's the first time I, I quit the job at the, mo- at the mobile station because we were, we had obligations on the road and, you know, my boss was so happy for me and, you know, it was uh he, he was the man in pumping for the man right yeah yeah but i mean that i think that was when i felt like i was like really like working i i i don't know i mean i say things in interviews aaron does it too and you remember you, you, maybe you lie to yourself or you remember it you hear about it from other people then you you start to remember it that way mm-hmm. you know like how how it really was i mean how it really was was like no thought went into anything, you know, <laughs> it's just, you know, we just go, 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 go. But, you know, it, when we were 18, what does any 18 year old out of high school want to do? You know, we wanted to record and we wanted to tour. We wanted to travel. And our first tour right when we got out of high school with God, we and Satan was Europe. You know, I mean, what the fuck? That was. I guess when, when did you guys realize that? Hey, oh my God, we really do have a unique offering, you know, in our combination of songs that are really good, songs that are serious, songs that are silly, songs that are making fun of other bands. Well, I mean, I, honest to God, I mean, and I wish I had more of it in me now, and I know that every band has it at that age of your life. I was so positive that I was in the greatest band of all time in the history of all recorded music, better than Bach and the Beatles. <laughs> like, you know, and, and we sucked you know, at that point, but I felt that way for a really, really long time. I, I you know, and it was just righteousness, young righteousness, you know, uh-huh. um, I thought we were punker than anybody, you know, but that uh, is a great thing, you know? And then l- later on when you, grow up or whatever the expression is, you find out, you know, you, or you realize that you're just part of like the eternal song that's been going on forever. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we're all contributing to it. It's not right to, if you don't like some other band's music, I'm really guilty of it. You shouldn't diss on them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because if it gets somebody off out there, if they have fans and it gets them off, and why, who am I to spoil it for them and say, no, that blows, you know? But don't mistake what I'm saying for the, that I, we don't have that righteousness. You know? Not as, we're just not as fucking obnoxious about it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, with, with, with the way you guys have, have made fun of bands in song. Oh, uh, no, no, no. I don't, like... I, 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 that, that's not what I mean. I, 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 that's not what I oh, mean. No, I'm I know, talking I was, about in the press. I was pivoting. Yeah, I, I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about in the press. I don't think Ween has ever been guilty of making fun of some of a band on a song. Um, and if we are, it's so obscure that nobody it would go over so many people's heads. You know, it like right. Uh, well, I guess the tributes, the humorous tributes, like Gabrielle it's, being but it's Lizzie but it's or... not though. It's it's it's. I mean the the way that song went down. If I remember it correctly. I wrote that song. I just discovered Thin Lizzy probably that week, you know? Yeah. And it was so uh, fucking listening to nothing but that, you know? And I wrote that song. And that's about as much thought as went into that. You, you know what I mean? There was no, 
there was no whatever about it. You know, there's no, um, I, I don't, I don't even, we had to answer that kind of question for so many years. Right. And we don't anymore, which is great. It's like, you know, what, what are Sorry. these guys? No, 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 it's okay. <laughs> but you know, what, what are, what are these guys intentions? You know, they're, right. they're trying to no, do, I mean, I always they're trying to do everything. Me. You know what I mean? It's like, well, where in the rule book, if there is a rule book says that you can't do everything. You know, right? Um, you I mean, know, I always so, took it to be a, 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 a tribute, like you know, Old Man Thunder being kind of a Seeger tribute. Yeah, there's just a, it's like a little thing, you know. It's just like a little, you put it on there. You know, I'm glad right. it's on there. <laughs> well, with with the Dean Ween Group project, what um, I guess what's different aside from the obvious and Aaron being absent? Uh, uh, well, it, it's not a project; it's very much its own thing. I, I fully intend on making records that's how i'm making them you know forever you know so i can't anymore um mm -hmm. i mean just you know the obvious thing is that i have to do everything myself which i hate i'm starting to starting to really get old i'm actually recording with kurt vile he's gonna walk in any minute oh cool yeah yeah we we uh just started recording together that's so funny. I, yeah. The last episode was Charlie Hall from War on Drugs. So he's he's Kurt file has been such a weird character in in our podcast. There's a lot of synergy there. <laughs> yeah, we interviewed Jen Cloer, who's Courtney and Barnett's partner, and they were on tour together. Kurt Vile walks in in the middle of that podcast, taking a shower. Right. Yeah. I'm just learning about all this. I just met Kurt when we did Bonnaroo last year. So, uh, oh, cool. but we both live right in the same area, and he's a really nice dude and a cool vibe and we'd love the same records and i knew immediately we'd be able to play together and write together that's great so you know, we have been and, and it went way better than you know any of us could have you know either of us could have expected so now we're, we're all over it but you know ween is i i hate the expression ween and dean ween and moist boys everything i've ever done is totally diy i mean i i have engineered Produced, recorded, played, written, sang, mixed, mastered every single note. And that's so much work. And then you have a business side of music that no one needs to know about if you're a music fan. You know what I mean? But that takes up 90% of what I... If if, if there's if Ween is there's 100% of Ween, 10% of it is me making music. You know, 90% is me on the phone, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know making shit is right you know um and so uh when it comes to that music thing to have to motivate myself to go to the studio alone and sit you know sit there alone all night you know and see a song through you know i i, I can do it i mean i've been doing it my whole life but um i really love bouncing ideas and collaborating um you know and and uh i guess that's the biggest difference you know right Right. And also with Ween, also with Ween, I didn't, Ween, we don't you know, think, never thought of things as a band when we were recording it. You know, the adaptation for the stage was a whole different animal, you know, and I think I'm working so much with a, a band now that I really like it. You know, I maybe subconsciously think of things, you know, I'm starting to think more in terms of the stage, you know, and I love it. You know, because right yeah. now that's the only way to make a living as a musician is touring. Right. You're not getting record. You never got record royalties even, you know, 30 years ago. So now you've. It, uh, well, I guess Ocean Man commercial, whatever that was, must have helped out, right? Oh, yeah, man. That made us like a whopping 6200 bucks, I think, before commissions. Oh, that's it? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Oh, man. I thought that was everywhere. Fuck that, man. Um, no, Like a Rock by Bob Seeger made a lot of money for somebody. Yeah. <laughs> Ocean Man, for the one week it was on for Honda. No, I thought. Right. I don't even. All right. How is the dynamic of like the Dean Wing group, and then when Aaron comes back into the fold, is it just like seamless? Or well, I don't really want to go into that very much. It's it's not it's not any different, really. I mean, we learned to play together. You know, we learned everything. You know what I mean? We we are on exactly the same page when we step on the stage. You know, it, it's it, especially the Dean Wing group is 
most of the guys or all of the guys from Ween. Right, right. You know? So if anything, I like to I like to kick back and not have to sing as much. <laughs> right, right. I, I love both. I'm getting the best of everything right now. In my mind, you know, that's great. I love it. You know, what do you make of all this? You know, you've been doing this for 30, 40 years, 30, right? 34 years. Um, yeah, uh, you're not going to believe me. No one believes me. So I don't even know if I should say it, but I don't, I don't do anything any differently. <laughs> uh, honestly, I mean, we've got nicer gear. I'm better at writing. I'm better at playing, better at performing, you know, but I I approach it the same exact way. I don't I don't have I don't take away any sense of pride, or, or, or better way to say it is I don't reflect at all. I I feel like, and I know I can speak for Claude and and most of my friends that 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 play. You know, I'm only as good as the last song I wrote or the last gig I did. Yeah, you know that's that's how I feel about it. Hold on a sec. I think Kurt's here. Can we wrap it up? Yeah, we'll wrap it up. I guess the, the last thing is just, um, what's the song you enjoy playing the most after all these years? Uh, the song I enjoy playing the most is Roses Are Free. The one that Fish covers. And the one that like people that have no idea what the hell they're talking about on the internet assume is like something, you know, if we play it on a jam festival, they think there's some calculated thing. I love well. I love the song first of all, but I love it because every single guy in the band is doing something different and is playing full tilt the whole song. It's like the ultimate sound check song. You know, it's like everybody is doing something tasty at the same time, as hard as they can, and it makes this one big beautiful sound. So that's actually my favorite song to play live. Is "Roses Are Free." <laughs> The one that started the whole the fish jam band thing, yeah. And this is where I would play you an excerpt of The Roses Are Free by Ween. But I'll leave it to you to seek that out and enjoy on your own the music of Ween and the Dean Ween group. Rock 2 is out on March 16th on Schnitzel Records. Special thanks to Juan Camilo Sarasa, Nora Terrell, Chandler Martin, Andrew Walls, Gabriel Reifer Cohen, and thanks to you for listening. Stay tuned for a new exciting serial podcast from Berkeley Online coming soon, and I will talk to you next month. <laughs>